if you'd like to follow and see what I'm doing right now, um, I hope you have either installed Paraview yourself uh, or you're using the um, that Julian kindly provided and have downloaded the two small data set, just sets that, that you've been. Okay, so I will end this one. Um, oh, and um, by the way, I didn't show you the last slide one. Um, so here I provided um, a couple of um, resources for you on, on the web. Um, I will just briefly show you them. So this is where you get the software. It's simply paraview.org. Then um, the discourse paraview.org website is um, the user forum for using Paraview. And um, if you post a question there, you usually get a response very, very quickly. Um, it's a great source for help. Then um, here is um, the DKZ website where we provide um, some, some tutorials. Um, you can also browse um, this one. Then um, PowerView, of course, also provides a number of different tutorials and tutorial data. Here are also a couple of um, slides from, from other people's presentation um, that you can look into. And um, here is um, the link of um, the animation that I mentioned. So you can um, play this in, PowerView, uh, in, in YouTube and you can um, move the data around. Okay. But now it's time for me to switch on PowerView. And um, I will very slowly go through everything. So in case any, everybody, somebody would like to, to follow what I'm doing. So when we are working with NetCDF files, let it um, be ICANN data, ECAM data, MPOM data, very handy tool is um, ncdump-h or ncdump-v to look in the data and see whether it's um, formed properly. And we also use um, CDO and the NetCDF tools to yeah, extract some certain areas or just um, do some, some data pre-processing. So when you start Paraview, um, you have um, on the right-hand side this big view. This is your 3D interaction view. Um, here on the left-hand side, you have your pipeline browser, and below you have um, the property settings, information about data if it's loaded, and here you would later be able to specify a color table. All this can be freely adjusted and is, of course, extended by a couple of um, plugins. The um, icon PowerView plugin that we developed is also a plugin that is available, and if you would like to follow, you would need, first need to to load this plugin, but you can also set it that it's auto load every time. So in order to do this, you go to Tools, Manage Plugins, and click on this one. And here on the right-hand side, you see a number of different plugins that are available. And um, <clears throat> in the next um, yeah, 40 minutes or 50 minutes or so, I will use um, the CDE reader. So you just click on this one and click on load selected. And you can also make a check mark on auto load. So the next time it's loaded automatically. And I will also show you the embossing representations. So also load the embossing representations as well. Then just close it. And um, we can just um, open the um, icon file. So first go to open. So I have mine here, and we first use um, the icon ocean data, select it, click on OK, and then PowerView prompts you because it has recognized um, the ending as NetCDF, and there are a couple of different NetCDF readers available, and uh, we use a CDE reader um, for this one. Just click on OK, and then under the properties menu, you can see the variables that are available, point variables and cell variables, and you simply click on apply. It's a very small data set. Um, it's just um, the top layer of an ocean data, um, the toy data, if you wish, and it provides a couple of different projections. And we can also cut out um, the, um, the land sea mask. So if you, for instance, click on use topography and simply click on apply again, 
then you see that um, there the lens C mask is um, cut out and you only have um, the ocean data vis visible. And of course, we provide a couple of different projections. So this is um, the longitude latitude projection. This would be um, the, the spherical projection. And then we have um, Cassini projection in case you're interested in the poles. Um, so sometimes I'm also visualizing ice um, at the South Pole and North Pole. And the interesting thing from the Cassini projection is that here in this Cassini projection, the poles are more or less um, yeah, displayed undistorted while the rest looks crappy. And um, Molvida, a classic one. But um, in this example, we will stay always with the longitude latitude projection. Then what you can do is um, you can look at the information tab. So here you see it's an unstructured grid. You see the number of cells, the number of points, um, the amount of memory it consumes. And you see here the different variables and also the data ranges of these variables. And if the data would be time varying, then below here, you would see the, the number of time steps and um, the time value itself. In order to visualize the data, um, a variable, you can just um, click on this one. So right now it uses a solid color to, to display the data. And we can use, for instance, TACC. Um, so this is the, the temperature of the data set. Um, of this ocean data. And what you've seen also, Paraview automatically annotates the data using the default color table, which ranges from blue to red. You can change that one later on and um, specify a different color table. You can also annotate this color table, changing TACC into temperature in degree C, for instance. And you can also annotate the view using um, other text describing the data in greater detail. So what you see in this screen right now is the so-called surface representation, but there are other representations as well available. Um, when you're loading very big data in for the first time, then Paraview usually just um, displays you an outline because um, this one is um, very easy to display and does, does not need much memory. Um, and um, at the moment, the data is displayed in 2D mode. So you see here a little 2D. If you click on this icon, um, the data is switched to 3D mode. Now the data is quite quite back, so you can use um, these um, icons to zoom to the data in close range. And now we can also switch back from outline to surface representation. And if you want to see um, the structure of the data, you can also select service with edges and keep you can see some um, triangular nature of our icon grid. So I switch back to surface representation and for ICANN, it's that most of the variables are represented as cell data. So that means one cell is uniformly colored, but we have also one quantity that is point data. And here we use point data. And here the data gets interpolated at the corners of those triangles. But mostly in ICANN, we work with, with uh, cell data. like here, kinetic energy. Um, other interesting um, to know about Paraview is um, that you can add a couple of different um, sources to the data. So you have those ones listed here. Sometimes I'm using a sphere that can be textured using um, the Earth's texture or a plane that can be textured using the Earth's texture. Um, you can apply to the data a number of different filters, um, transforming the data from cell data to point data, um, thresholding the data, computing um, the gradient, and you name it. Paraview is a very, very powerful tool. And you have um, other different representations on the data. So when you click on, 
on the right hand side here, you can split the view either horizontally or vertically. So I'm just doing this right now. And here you have um, an overview of what other views are available. If you load more plugins, then maybe different views become available in here and also different filters become available. But um, right now I would like to just um, show you the, um, the histogram view. Um, so currently nothing is displayed because in this pipeline you see this eye over here, the data is grayed out so it's not switched on. In order to make it display in this side, um, I have to switch it on. And then in the properties menu, I can select what kind of array I would like to visualize um, as histogram. So I'm just going for the temperature and here you see the temperature array. And what you can do now is you can just kind of look into the data and make some selections. For instance, I would like to select the color and um, the, the temperature range from 20 degrees C to 25 degrees C. And I'm interested in where those cells are. So in order to do so, you have some, some additional icons over here, um, add selection, and then draw a rectangular selection. And so what I can do is just um, draw a rectangular box like this. And I see that those cells are selected. And what you see now is that those two views are different representations of the data and they are linked together. So the data that I've selected on the right hand side is also selected on this side. And I can use this feature, for instance, also to, to debug the model, to find maybe outliers in the data and um, not only use it for creating a cool image for, for one conference or for a paper, but also really to get me insight into the data. Another interesting view is um, spreadsheet view. So I'm just closing this one, but you see that the selection stays the same. And I'm showing you a spreadsheet view. It's something like Excel. Um, so you see in here all the data and um, you see the, the cell IDs um, and you see the data ranges. Okay, those are the land cells, they're all empty. But what you can also do is you can just kind of um, um, sort by minimum, maximum. So now I have sorted by highest salinity and I can change the selection in here, like those cells that are very, very salty, at least in my simulation. And in here on the visual representation, I can directly see where those cells are. I'm a computer science guy, not a meteorologist, but these are the areas that I would suspect to be saltiest on Earth. Anyway, um, this being that, <clears throat> You can also um, connect together a couple of different different views, um, 3D views. So let's have another 3D view on this side. It is the same data. And now I would like to visualize a different variable on this one, like temperature. And I connect can connect these views together. So I make a right mouse click on this one and then a small dialog opens and the first one says link camera. So I click on this and then I select this view and now both views are linked together and I can explore in detail certain areas of my, of my um, data and um, I can look at two different variables. And I've seen that there was a question Oops, that's the wrong one. Okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, but um, yeah, sometimes it's also interesting to, to derive new quantities of the data. So our, our pipeline is very short so far. So just um, the, the open file. And here you have a, 
a number of different tools, including, for instance, um, the calculator, where you can derive um, a couple of, of new files, uh, new variables. So when I'm looking at the data that I have, the variables that I have available, um, also um, the, the three velocities, UACC, VACC, and WACC. And now I'm using the calculator to compute the vector field um, for this data. So I select cell data. I rename the array to vel. And then it gets a little cryptic. Um, but what you have to do is also written on the DKZ website in one of those tutorials. You have to use um, the individual individual components like u underscore ACC times i hat plus v underscore ACC times j hat plus w underscore ACC times k hat. Now I have a typo. K hat. And then you click on apply. These i hat, j hat, and k hat are, are the unit vectors in Paraview. And what you simply do is um, you um, just um, assign each of these unit vectors one of those scalar fields for the velocities. So the two horizontal velocities and um, the vertical velocity. And then you have here a new variable called um, velocity, veal. And you see that Paraview automatically derives the magnitude for these ones, so the velocity magnitude. And um, you can also access the individual components, x, y, and z. Okay. And so I'm just um, browsing from time to time to see if you have any questions on this one. Um, but I also would like to have um, another variable that is directly the magnitude as a scalar field. So what I can do, I can apply a second calculator to this one. It's also a cell data. I call it mag. And then Paraview has a built-in function to, call the mag to, to compute the magnitude. So it's just um, mag. And then in brackets, you write um, the velocity field, like VEL. That's how I named it. And then you have um, this, this variable derived. Then um, earlier in one of those um, animations, I have told you that you can, in Paraview, um, compute the, the vorticity, the gradient of the vector field, um, the divergent, and the Q criterion. Um, although most of these variables to derive from such a low resolution model would not make sense, but I'm doing it anyway. Um, just to um, yeah show you how it's possible. So for this, um, there's um, a filter available. It's um, called um, gradients of unstructured data sets. Uh, what you can also do is um, go for search and then simply type grade, and then he automatically pinpoints you to the one filter that is available. And here you have to give the um, vector array. Um, eventually, I have to uh, switch on to this one. So we go to Vel. And um, you want to compute the gradient, the divergence, the vorticity, and the Q criterion. Then you click on Apply. And for this small data set, it's very, very fast. And then you see that you have a number of different um, uh, new variables that um, allow you to better describe some some velocities and some um, flow fields uh, flow that that you have in, in your data. And as you can see for all the variables that I um, apply the first time that I visualize the first time, Paraview always assigns this called warm color table um, and this can of course be changed. So for temperature, it makes sense, but for salinity, maybe um, it does not. And um, so in order to, to change this one, um, you can simply go to edit, or you can also click on this color map editor. You might, may find it on the right-hand side, but then you can drag it over to this side in order to maximize um, your, your screen real estate. 
Okay, and um, in here, PowerView um, allows you to select from a number of previously defined color tables. So just go to choose preset. Um, this is um, this little heart icon down here. So you click on this one and you see already a number of fields. And um, but there are even more. So these were the default color tables and here are all that are in PowerView available. And you can, of course, um, specify more yourself. So for salinity, um, sometimes um, I'm using this linear blue. You can click on apply and close, but I would like it to have it um, the, the opposite around so that um, the very salty areas are colored very lightly and the darker areas um, are the ones that are less salty. So what you can do here is you can simply switch this color table and then also adjust the data range because in, in the model, as the data is written out, the salinity values range from 0 to 39. And so I would like to change that to something like 34. And then you say rescale. And then you have, um, yeah, more meaningful visualization of um, the salinity in your data. OK. Um, then I was uh, earlier telling you um, or asking you also to um, to load the embossing representation of the data. And um, I would like to tell you what you can do with this now. So in one of the civilizations that I've shown you um, in, in the presentation, um, in the PowerPoint, I was using um, salinity um, and that enhanced by bump mapping of the data to show the velocity so or temperature. And this is um, what I would like to show you now. So we are, um, have to first um, convert data from cell data to point data because this bump mapping is only available for, for point data. In order to do so, you just go to the filters and alphabetical. And just as a side note, those filters that have been grayed out in here are not applicable to the kind of data that you have at the moment. Every, every filter that is kind of highlighted or presented in full, you can apply it to the data. So now we would like to apply the cell data to point data filter. So you simply click on it and then it gives you a couple of options. So we would like to process all arrays um, and we would also like to pass on the cell data. Um, if I click on apply and then you see what, what we've done. So we actually duplicated the, the, the data, the variables. So now I have them available both at cell data and as point data. Because I'd like to visualize, you to, to visualize the data as cell data, I select temperature from down here. And then from representation, I go to bump mapped surface. Click on this one and you already see um, that there's some shading um, that highlights the velocity, the magnitude. So you can um, fine tune this below. I just have to find it. Oh, okay, here. Um, bump map surface. So here's the data array that you want to use for, for this bump mapping. It has automatically shown uh, uh, chosen the magnitude, but you can also just use um, the U component or the V component or any other data array that kind of makes sense. And with this um, scaling factor, you can specify how strong the setting would be. Usually I don't use 10, but two, but in this low resolution data, um, it, uh, it's not showing very well, but it's just a little bit to um, yeah, show you what power you can, can do with your data. Uh, the other embossing representation that we have is um, surface extrusion. So I leave the variable set to temperature and now I go to extrusion surface. Mm, that looks a little bit different. 
And um, here is also uh, an area where I can um, specify this. So it's also currently using the magnitude, but I would like to use um, the magnitude as cell variable. And then you see that, um, oops, hello. then really these triangles, the cells are, are kind of sticking out. I unfortunately do not have sea surface height in here in this data set, but this would be kind of um, a very natural variable where I would use this. In other representations or other relations, we have also used similar relation technique like this one to visualize um, the amount of rain, for instance, to for relation of um, the monsoon. And um, the, the higher the bar, the bigger the, the amount of precipitation. And you can kind of go through the different fields and see what what this function can do for you. When um, you're not using cell variables, but point variables, you see that it changes a little bit, then the surface gets a little bit smoother. Depending on what you would like to achieve with your relation, either one might be a good good addition to kind of express two different variables in, in one representation. Okay. <clears throat> um, now I have talked a little bit about this one and I would like to go over to annotate the data. So um, I have shown you that um, using the color map, you can specify different color maps. Um, click on apply, for instance, this one. Uh, you can specify um, the opacity and um, any point that you want um, at different colors. And you can also um, change this annotation. So what you can do is uh, you can simply grab this color table and put it at a different location. Uh, you can also make it um, horizontal instead of vertical. You can make it longer and you see the medically adjusts. You can um, change the description to something more meaningful like um, temperature and then in brackets degree C, click on apply and so on. You can um, make the font a little bit bigger so it's easier to read. But for this one, um, this is really very well documented in um, the PowerView tutorial that is available from, on the website from powerview.org. If you browse at the DKZ tutorial website, you will also find a quite old PDF PowerView tutorial that I created yeah, around six years ago, I guess. Um, most of the information that you will find in there is probably still valid and would give you a good start. That also comes along with um, uh, some data files that, that you can download uh, to get you going for the beginning. And of course, if you have any questions, you can also um, send us emails depending on the, on the amount of email that I get. I can try to answer all of them or I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Um, you can also annotate um, your visualization using some text. So here you go to sources, alphabetical and add some text. One more, there you go. And then change the text, icon, ocean, data, click on apply. And you can also drag this around or not. Hmm, maybe not. Or change um, a different font and so on. All the functions that you see in PowerView can also be animated, but that would be a different topic um, that we would handle in our um, hands-on tutorials. In order to give you a hint where to do this, you would go to View, Animation View, and then down here you can kind of um, create camera movements and so on, but I will skip this for now. But what you can do is um, you can save screenshots and animations very easily. So in order to do this, you just go to File, uh, Save Screenshot, and then you just um, apply 
where to store a PNG or um, a JPEG image. And for animation, it's very similar. You go to Save Animation. And then what I usually do is um, I write out PNGs in case maybe sometimes Paraview crashes. And if you write out, um, if you have an animation that is a thousand frames, maybe takes a couple of minutes per frame, then um, it would be very unfortunate um, if Paraview crashes at frame 950 or so. Um, so um, that's why I'm not writing out video files like Ogvorbis format, but um, or, or AVI files. I'm just writing out PNGs. And when I just um, try to do this test, then you see a new window. And here you can specify the screen resolution that you have and um, also um, the, the time steps. Because in here, I only have one time step. Um, below this one, there would be kind of a window where you can specify which frames to render. OK. Um, and then also very convenient is um, to source, stay, save the state that you have. You go to File, Save State, and then uh, you can kind of save the state and later continue your work um, on the same setting. And when you're later loading a state, you can also um, change the data files. So if you would like to create a simulation like this one, but with different input data, all you have to do is load the state. And then in the dialog that pops up, you can specify the new data files. And then Paraview will do the rest and make the same simulation with um, the other data files. But those other data files need to be kind of the same data structure, the same resolution, and also the same variables, of course, to be present in there. OK, how I'm doing on the time? Still have half an hour left. Um, I see that there are a couple of questions. I will quickly um, look into this in a minute. But um, first, I would like to reset the session, kind of to, to reinitialize it without quitting. So you can do this from Edit and then go to Reset Session. Then Dialog is asking you, are you really sure? Yes, I am. Yes, um, there was a question. I have another question about the structure of the input data. So what question do you have? Niklas, hi. Can I just switch on my microphone? It's better to ask than to read. Uh, sure. Uh, hi. I um, have a question about, for example, input data that instead of being net CDF are mm -hmm. um, MET files, so produced uh, in MATLAB. And the structure I was mentioning regarded the variable name followed by a timestamp, followed by uh, the vertical level, and uh, followed by U or V component. So if I have a long series of that, instead of importing it manually, assuming that Paraview can swallow that, instead of importing that manually, is there any chance or way I can explain Paraview he should take in all that data in sequence? Thanks. Yes, yes, that works. Um, it's some time ago, but I was also opening um, a MATLAB file in Paraview, but I had to transform it a little bit. So I think I transformed the data to CSV, um, so comma separated values, and then opened that one. Um, but other than that, um, there's uh, a number of different um, readers for Paraview available. So if you would just go to uh, File open and you see what power of you can all read. It's kind of really long list. Um, and MATLAB and, is um, not there. MATLAB is not there. Okay, I, I haven't checked. So what you can do is you can um, import raw information, uh, raw data. Then you have to specify what um, what bit size is this data: 16 bit, 32 bit. Um, then um, the uh, dimensionality, um, the header size, and so on. And if that also is not working, 
you can default to the so-called VTK files. So Paraview sits on top of VTK, VTK Civilization Toolkit. And um, VTK files are, have a very simple and easy data structure. And I'm pretty sure that um, there's a way in transforming MATLAB files to VTK. And Thank you very much. You, and if you don't find any information, then um, please go to the, the forum that I mentioned earlier. So this one, um, discourseparaview.org. Um, you can just um, sign up and then um, ask this question. And um, if you're the first one to have this problem, which I doubt, um, then somebody else will chip in and, and be able to help you. Um, there was another question um, here. Does Paraview only work well with icon data or can I use, um, use it with data from other models like the variables, resolution, CSM, MPAS? Yes, you can. Um, as I mentioned before, there are a couple of different NetCDF readers um, that, that work with uh, Paraview. So I used um, ECAM, regular NetCDF data, and uh, also the MPIM ocean data, where you have a tripolar curvilinear grid. Um, those two data sets can be read in with um, the uh, regular NetCDF CF reader in Paraview. And there's also a dedicated MPAS reader um, that, you can, that you can use. But this is not developed um, by us. Um, then I'm just browsing through this one. Okay, I think this was it for now. Um, then um, let's see, time-wise, I do have a couple of minutes left. So I'm trying to open the last data that I have. So go to open. Um, this is atmospheric data. It is actually very high resolution data. Um, so it's um, five kilometer globally, but um, I've cut out a very small portion to to make it um, yeah manageable in this tutorial because this data is 3D. Um, so here you see all this variable that you can see in there. Um, I, I have this um, checkbox show 3D surface, and then in Paraview is um, loading all these um, 3D variables together. Um, the variable that you can see here are um, 3D and 2D variables. So liquid cloud water, CLW, is a 3D variable. You can see it um, on the side that not all levels are covered. Uh, a variable such as um, surface wind is um, a 2D variable, which is kind of now repeated um, over, over all these areas. Mm. I will probably not get through all of this, what I had planned, but um, I'm just going to um, use the calculator once more. In uh, one of the visualizations that I've shown you previously in the presentation, I um, used volume rendering and a combination of um, liquid cloud water and cloud ice together. Uh, into one variable. And this is what I would like to do now. So um, I'm using the calculator module again. It's um, for cell data. The resulting array I just named cloud. And um, because cloud ice is usually um, a little bit um, smaller in the values than um, cloud water, I kind of multiply and add those together. So I just write CLW plus something like 2.5 times CLI click on apply and then I do have my my variable in here and <clears throat> volume rendering exists for both regular data and uh, unstructured grid data such as icon but um, volume rendering is much faster for regular grid data and in Paraview there's of course a filter for everything so what we do now is um, we are resampling the data to image data so resample to image, click on OK. Um, then Paraview is using the input bounds um, of the data. And here you can um, yeah, specify the, the domain. Okay. And then uh, it shows me this. I can select my new cloud variable and volume rendering. And also for this one, Paraview is using this um, default black and white color table. Um, you can see if you look close that there are a couple of different layers, but um, there are also um, a few artifacts and 
if you want to create kind of a realistic visualization, um, clouds are usually not um, bluish and reddish, at least not when I'm looking outside how it's raining in here in Hamburg. So what you can do is um, you can adjust the color table. Um, I'm using this black and white one. Click on apply, close. And the highest color, black one, um, I just double click on the color and move it a little bit up. So something grayish like this. And so this looks a little bit more realistic. And so what I'm doing now is probably a bit difficult to, to follow if you would like to participate. But um, you maybe can do this later on with um, the, the video that um, Julian is creating. So in order to um, yeah, make the, the rendering a little bit nicer, I would like to increase the sampling disk um, depth. So what you have here, if you scroll a little bit down here, um, make sure that you have um, the advanced options here switched on using this gear icon. Otherwise, you will not see this one. Um, and this one just tells Paraview how dense um, this one should be sampled. Smaller numbers, um, the sampling is a little bit denser. But what you see here um, in these ringing artifacts, this is um, uh, an artifact when um, the GPU is used for, for volume rendering. Um, I could explain the technical things to you, but I think I don't have the time for that. But I do have a quick fix for this. Uh, we are simply using ray tracing. Um, built in in Paraview is um, ray tracing for both optics, um, the NVIDIA version, as well as Osprey, the Intel product. And um, as I don't have the proper NVIDIA graphics hardware in my computer, I only use um, the, the one with, with uh, from Intel. And what you can do is enable ray tracing, and then you see these options. And um, you see that there's some, some artifacts. And what you can do is you can activate the denoising. But the uh, Intel denoiser needs at least five samples per pixel to perform this. Thing looks a bit better. OK, but um, because this is a little bit um, yeah, uh, intense on the little laptop, um, I switch back to the default version. Then um, before we have uh, around 15 minutes for question, I would like to show you one last thing. You can also um, threshold the data. This is um, an option that I'm usually uh, that they use off often. And you can also um, clip and slice the data. So right now, I would like to um, use um, a slice of the data to annotate um, the amount of precipitation at the bottom. So here you can see um, slicing plane. You can move the slicing plane through Paraview. Uh, you can also kind of make an oblique slice, but you can also specify um, that it's axis aligned, for instance, um, at the z-axis. So I simply click apply on this one because I would like to um, visualize a 2D variable that is the same on any height. And now I need to move it down um, below the clouds. So I'm using um, another filter on this one. I go for search. And this one is called transform. And um, don't want to show the box. I just want to go in the z direction down by um, minus 0.5, something like this, I think. OK, then you see that um, this slice is um, down there. And um, here, I would like to visualize the variable PRLR, uh, which is um, large scale precipitation. Uh, there it is. OK, also use using the default color table um, for this one. Um, and you see there where um, large scale precipitation is happening. We can switch this one to something maybe bluish. And then you see where it's raining a lot. Must be Hamburg, at least at the moment. Um, 
Yeah, then just um, very, very quickly, um, what you can do with um, with the threshold filter and um, the clip. So I will just um, switch off all of these. So this is um, one variable. Um, so threshold um, is um, this icon over here. Um, and as you can imagine, you can threshold your data um, to um, yeah, a certain amount. So I'm low using um, liquid cloud water, CLW, um, specify the maximum and the minimum like this one. And so here you have um, selected the liquid cloud water cells that are above this threshold. And then you can further use this data in, in other relations. And then sometimes it's also necessary to, to clip away a certain part of the data. So um, that will clip away half of the data. And then on the other half, you can uh, visualize, uh, not this one, maybe this one and that one. And then you see that you can easily create very complex relations um, using different variables. But what is really important um, to keep in mind is um, that um, it's sometimes very easy to screw up everything using wrong color tables and um, also cluttered displays. Um, for the color tables, it's important to not put in there any barriers that are not meaningful. For instance, um, when you have, for instance, this, um, uh, this um, warm called color table, you have this white in between. And to a viewer, it can mean that this must be a very important barrier, a kind of a border that you have in your, in your data. And um, if it's not the case um, that you don't want to highlight this, then you probably should choose uh, a more homogeneous color table, um, such as the one above, like this one. Okay, um, I think I will end my Paraview demonstration here. We do have um, 12 minutes left for questions, and um, I'm just um, going back into here. Uh, so, da da da. Can it substitute any GIS software? What do you mean? Can you elaborate a little bit? Okay, no. There's one more question. May I? Yes, you can. Let me hi, let me switch on the microphone again. So my question regards the uh, possibility of uh, connecting Paraview to the uh, to the cluster in my case by doing an SSH connection. I see that mm -hmm. from the file menu, you can do that. And since I'm working with large data sets, I very often find myself having to do this manually. So uh, connecting manually to the SS with an SSH bridge to the cluster, doing my pre-processing, bringing the data home on my um, on my local drive and then working from there. Instead of doing that, I was wondering if there was any chance of uh, persuading Paraview to do this by its own internally. I've seen that this option is indeed available. Uh, could you talk a bit about that? Thanks. Um, I never used it like this and I didn't know that this feature exists actually. But um, yes, there are other possibilities that you can use. Um, I can try to elaborate on two. So, in, at DKRZ, in our data center, we have um, dedicated GPU nodes and um, they share the same file system as the supercomputer. And what we do is um, we run Paraview remotely um, on, a, on X using um, virtual GL and um, Turbo VNC. And so you simply create a VNC session with a remote desktop and then connect using um, a locally installed VNC viewer and um, have the benefit that you don't need to transfer all the big data files. So all the visualization is happening right in the compute hall and instead on, on your small laptop. That would be option one. If um, 
you don't like this one, what you can do is um, you can do it as um, I elaborated a little bit earlier with um, the client server setting. Um, so what you can do is you can start a PowerView server on your remote machine, so on your supercomputer, and then make sure that um, the, the port number is open, that you can connect on this one, and then start the client on your, on your local machine. And then you just um, have to select, uh, click on one button, specify a certain address, and you can, can work remotely. So the relation, again, is happening um, on the server, on the supercomputer, but um, the user interface is, um, is on your side. That's exactly what I was looking for. Thanks. OK. Um, then there was a question, have you transformed WAR files to work with Paraview? Yes, I have. Um, that was um, recently. Uh, I, I did this my first time. And I simply used um, the normal NetCDF CF reader to, to read in those data files. Um, I'm not sure if um, I encountered any difficulties. If you have and need help, just um, write me an email, and then we can try to sort it out. But yes, it works. Um, there was uh, another question. What are the main reasons why more people are not yet using Paraview? I have no idea. Um, specific computational resources everyone might not have access to. Steep learning curve, yes, this is definitely true. Um, limited adaptability to wide variety in data sets, no, I wouldn't think so. so Paraview really supports an enormous amount of um, different data formats. And um, if um, it does not have a reader um, to read your data, then you can develop um, a plugin to read the data in yourself. This is what I did for Icon Data. There was no Icon NetCDF reader available. And I started um, this Icon Reader from scratch. Um, it took me a little bit. Um, but basically, what you can do is you can use any of these readers as layout and try to fill in the blanks for your specific data. And why not more people are using Paraview? I have no idea. It's really very powerful. I've seen it grown over the last couple of years tremendously. Um, it's really, really powerful. And today I probably just scratched the surface. I encourage you to come back to, to our relation courses. In the beginning, there was a little bit steep learning curve for me because I was um, used to a different tool called Aviso, and it had a different workflow, a different pipeline. And the first time I needed to visualize something, it probably took me an hour. Now I think I'm much more efficient. Um, did you use any radar data with Paraview? No, I did not, but other people do. Um, so you just can import point data sets. And, um, if you go to the to the Paraview website, um, which I have now that the discourse, um, somewhere here is also um, a blog, um, and then you can can look on this one. Um, don't know where that was. Uh, so here, um, and in here I have um, some somewhere read um, some stuff about this one. So this is also a very good resource. OK. Um, we do have a few minutes left. Any other questions? And um, in case you, you get a question later on and um, that you don't have in mind right now, you can, of course, send an email to me, um, ruber at dkz.de, and um, I can try to answer those depending on the volume, of course. Other than that, I hope I have not missed a question yet. Um, I will scroll through again. one record a GUI session into a script that can then be adapted to the automatization. Yes, this can be done. Um, so in Paraview, you have um, macros. I have not yet worked with macros, but um, basically everything in Paraview is scriptable using Python. And you can also store your, your state files as Python script, and then can later use, um, yeah, um, 
this Python script to control Paraview. Um, another way, what we the the big video that I showed you, um, that that the one that I have on YouTube, this was also rendered um, in batch mode. So I specified um, all the state files and some scripts. Um, run scripts on Mistral and all those images have been visualized on the compute nodes without any interaction. In, um, to set this up, I had these um, uh, visualization made ready and um, all I had to do is, um, was specifying the resolution and um, where the data should be stored, then submitting the script um, into our Slurm and then um, I got an email once, once it was done. Okay, I have this one. I think I have all those questions. Any other question so far? If not, then um, I'm. Thank you for your attention, um, for for listening what we were doing, and for your time. And as said in the beginning, there will definitely be a very um, dedicated um, hands-on tutorial in presence after Corona sometime, and then we can probably talk in, in more detail.